Hello everyone and welcome back to my channel. I'm really excited to share this video with you guys today because it's going to be very different from my previous videos. Normally my videos are very formal and fact-based, backed up by previous research done. This video is going to be essentially talking about my past experiences, my childhood experiences, and how it kind of all relates to child development and things that I still talk about on this channel. So in today's video, I'm going to be talking about three things that I learned growing up with selective mutism and basically how my journey affected my outlook on life and, you know, how it affects my work now and what I do, what my passion is and all of that stuff. So for those of you who don't know, I was diagnosed with selective mutism at the age of five. So basically what it is, it's a childhood anxiety disorder in which you have a fear of speaking in social settings. So that can include the classroom setting, the restaurant setting, family gatherings, any kind of social setting pretty much. And the only people that I spoke to were my parents and my sisters. And I've talked about this in a previous video. It's actually one of the first videos that I ever filmed for this channel. So I'll be linking that down that below because it goes into a little bit more depth about treatment and things like that. But I'll just give you a brief synopsis of pretty much what my treatment looked like. My parents were given two options. The first was therapy and the second was medication. So they were really opposed to putting me on a medication at the age of five, so they went with the therapy, as you know, I probably would have done. The journey itself was quite overwhelming and stressful, not only for me, but for my parents as well, as you can imagine. My parents were very focused on the result and not so much the journey itself. So I think there are a lot of key things that I probably would have done differently if my child were going through this, just because it's, you know, parenting then is obviously a lot different from parenting now. And I think even now some parents rely on very old methods and strategies like yelling and screaming and um, not really so much conscious parenting, but just things that they have had in their childhood that they just implement now because it's what they're used to, it's what they're comfortable with, it's you know somewhat what society is comfortable with. So there are key things that I probably would have done differently, but nonetheless, it's what happened, and you know I'm just going to be sharing with you what I learned from it. So the first thing I probably learned was that children are very perceptive. And coming from my own experience, because I kind of lacked in the social department you know, I wasn't really social with anyone other than my parents and my sisters. So I had to kind of develop a different sense of communication. So I became very perceptive and observant and I relied on facial expressions and physical gestures to, you know, I guess guide me through that social interaction. And I became very observant of how others use facial expressions to get their feelings across. And, you know, I kind of developed that sense to do it back. but. I think in general, kids are naturally perceptive and sometimes we don't always appreciate or acknowledge how perceptive they truly are. A lot of society today tends to group kids in, um, with different labels, I guess, you know, so there are kids that are strong willed, there are kids that have a bad temper, there are kids that are even well behaved or, you know, anything. But when we think of adults, or at least when I think of adults, I, you know, can individualize them. You know, this person works this job, or this person has this car, this person is in this, you know, working class, or, you know, whatever the case is. They are very individualized, but when, when we group children, we don't focus on that. We don't really focus on their personality traits, they, we just focus on their behavioral traits. And most of the time, that behavior comes from a source. It stems from something deeper and larger than we, what we don't currently realize. So when we're grouping children based on their behavior, we're kind of setting them up for failure in a sense. There is always a cause for that behavior. There are positive and negative behaviors, but all of those, no matter what kind of behavior you're, uh, I guess, categorizing it as, it's still coming from some kind of need or desire from that child. So if the child is exhibiting positive behaviors and they get your attention, well, great, they got your attention. If the child is exhibiting negative behaviors, well, great, they got your attention again. And maybe that need is attention. Maybe that need is that they're struggling and they want to be helped, but they don't know how to ask for help. 
maybe that need is that they want to you know tell you how they're feeling but they don't know how to approach the situation so there are plenty of needs and desires and wants that our children have you know based on their age that we don't currently realize and we limit ourselves to helping them by grouping them and labeling them and i think that's why we forget why children are so perceptive and they have such um, a complex thinking process and we kind of belittle them by just grouping them and labeling them into those you know very definitive categories so the second thing i learned was that every child needs an emotional connection and i talk about this in almost all of my videos because again i think it's that important and and i do think that it's it's something that i've come to realize not only in my journey through you know having selective mutism and overcoming selective mutism but it's something that i found that i still needed in my teenage years when family was complicated and you know both parents were in the picture and it's something that i still need as an adult and sometimes i find that i lack so it's it's not just important in childhood but it's something that you can start in childhood and develop and make it more complex and you know have with you for any kind of situation and it's something that you need for every kind of situation not just your parents but your peers your co-workers you know uh, significant other relationships in any kind of setting you'll need that you'll need that emotional connection so like I mentioned, my parents were very results oriented and not process oriented. So when they were getting all these therapists, they were definitely focused on not only treating me, but they were focused on, okay, this is what's going to help her get to the end. This is what's going to help her get to speak. And that's, that's it. That's what we need. But because I didn't have that social connection with my peers and my teachers and friends. So it's something that I needed, but I didn't have for my parents because they were focused on getting me better. They weren't focused on walking me through it. You know, I know that they didn't really know what was going on and how exactly they could help, but it's little things like I talk about on this channel. Asking questions, first of all, is probably one of the biggest things a parent can do to help build that social and emotional connection for their child. Getting them to think critically, getting them to become more vulnerable to you, getting them to, you know, have that better understanding of communicating with someone, you know, talking about what we're feeling inside and what's bothering us and just being there and giving them that significance. So that communication was definitely not there with my parents. I, you know, never really talked about the way I was feeling. I never really talked about things that were working in therapy, things that weren't working in therapy. I kind of just used that social outlet as, you know, as a means to go crazy, if you will. It was all kind of surface level communication with my family because they were the only source of communication I had. I didn't talk about my feelings because I didn't feel comfortable sharing my feelings and I think of course it does stem from the fact that you know I didn't talk to others so I had to make up for it in a different way talking to my family but it was definitely something that was key and I think that could have shortened that journey for me if I had that emotional outlet with them you know I think when we think about needs for a child we think very minimally so we focus on their survival needs but every human has two kinds of needs and it depends on where what stage you're at in life so a child has two kinds of needs so there are survival needs like food shelter water things like that but there are also thrival needs and thrival needs consist of having an emotional connection um, social interaction and having a passion or a purpose, a significance, if you will. But a child needs survival and they need thrival. And we focus more on the survival because it's what society tells us. It's what history has told us. But in order to thrive, we need to adapt and respond to our environment. And our environment is changing very quickly, especially with technology 
and you know every kind of outlet you can have at the touch of your fingertips everything is at our fingertips and social media is taking over so in order to thrive we need to have that connection and we need to feel like we belong we need to feel like we are a part of something greater we're a part of a community but it starts with that relationship with a parent so the parent-child relationship is the first means of emotional connection that children have and we don't necessarily focus on that because we're way too focused with our own lives and we're too focused on setting them up for future success but a part of that is that emotional connection because if you don't have the emotional connection there are other things that start to develop in the child like anxiety depression things that this younger generation is experiencing that are on the rise because we are still in that old parenting mindset but that old parenting mindset didn't have the environment that we have today so we have to be very responsive to our environment in order to set our child up for success so again that needs that means an emotional connection the third thing and the final thing that i want to leave you guys with is that every child has an inner voice myself included but for my situation my inner voice was suppressed but i knew i had one i just couldn't communicate it but every child in their own way has an inner voice and it's greatly impacted by their environment so in my case mine was impacted by the disorder i had and my family dynamic that we developed because of it so in a way it was definitely diminished but i think especially in today's society we tend to forget about things that really matter we try so hard to set our children up for success like even when they're so young, getting them into the right school, maybe it's a private school, and then making sure their grades are good, and then making sure they're in enough extracurricular activities, and then making sure they're in the right college, and then making sure they have that perfect job. But so many people in today's society, and so many people that I know, graduate from a college and get this fantastic degree, and then they end up hating their job. Or they get this degree and graduate, and then they realize that that's not the career path that they want to go on. And some people end up dropping out because they really hate school and they don't like being there. But because on paper it looked so good, they thought they were on the right path. But it doesn't matter what's on paper. It matters what's, what's inside, where that, where that inner voice wants you to go, where your passion, your drive, your motivation, what do you want to pursue? You're never going to have the life that you want to live and the life of thrival if you're just going with societal expectations you have to listen to what you truly want to do what makes you happy because as the saying goes if you love what you do and if you're happy with you do you'll never have to work a day in your life so i think everyone should kind of stick with that motto and parents need to have that kind of mindset that you know we can't push our children to be something that they're not because it always ends up kind of not where you want it to be so pretty much those are principles that I found, I guess, as a reflection of today where I was back then and things that I've learned and I've perceived as an adult that I really think have impacted the way I was as a child. I think these three principles are generalized and basic enough that they can apply to any kind of family setting or any kind of family dynamic and any kind of child, pretty much. It doesn't matter where what your environment is these principles still apply they're still relevant and they're still important so with that being said i hope you guys enjoyed this video i hope you learned something as always so i just wanted to quickly announce that spots for my one-to-one -one are opening up so if you'd like to sign up and see if we're a good fit to work together use the link down below and i don't have a any kind of blog and as also, I just wanted to quickly mention that my blog will be linked down below. There is no set blog for this video just because I wanted to make this a little bit more personal for you guys, but I did have a blog recently come out about managing parent emotions. So if you'd like to check that out, go ahead. I'll leave that link down below. So thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time. Bye.